Bobby Labonte from Corpus Christi, Texas, wins the seventh Brick Yard 400 at Indianapolis. All right, well, why don't we get started? Bobby, thanks for joining me today. It's uh, always a pleasure to talk to you. First and foremost, how are you and Kristen doing? You uh, battling this COVID-19 okay? What's going on in your world? Well, Tony, thanks for having me on, and I appreciate the uh, the invite to do this. And, and Chris and I are doing fine. Uh, we have um, been at our house now for about 70-some-odd days. Uh, we've kind of put ourselves in a uh, – uh, we stay here. We've got 16 acres of land and a lot of work to do on our house. So, And uh, so we are ready to get back to some racing as well. As you know, the last time I saw you was in Sebring. And we came home, and it was pretty much a week after that that we isolated ourselves here. So uh, we'd love to get back with Scott and, um, you know, thinking about going back to uh, going to Sebring and going back to the next race we can go to is going to be exciting. So looking forward to getting COVID as a uh, something in the back of our mind instead of always at the front of our mind. Hopefully that'll be sooner than later. You and Kristen have had – an amazing year. You get voted into the Hall of Fame, and that's our Hall of Fame. What an incredible honor. At the same time, your wife graduates from Duke and gets her MBA, and what an exciting time in your life. In spite of all this COVID, tell, tell me about your experience with going to the Hall of Fame. What a when that happened, it, people start asking you questions about different questions, not about how did you run last weekend or what are you going to do to run better next weekend? Or what did you do last weekend, next weekend? It's like, how did all this happen? Right? So they start dive, diving deep into your, into your life. Leading up to that was so cool because you start remembering the stuff that you did and you know, you didn't forget it. You just don't talk about it a lot. I don't talk about it. So when we're leading up to it, talking about how we, how that happened for me my family, my brother and all that stuff, and I mean, it really just puts it all together for you. And so the Hall of Fame was really for me about putting everything together, especially in our case with my family and friends, <clears throat> co-workers that were a part of it. And so when we celebrated for January 31st, getting to that point, I, I put a thing on Twitter about every Thursday of just things that, you know, kind of cemented what it took to get there from hard work, labor to Bill Davis helped me to all this and late models and Bush Grand National. And, uh, and then on the last Thursday before the ceremony, I had a picture of my dad, myself and my brother at a quarter midget track. And I was two years old. So you think about <clears throat> as old as I am today, when I was two years old, that is a lifetime. And that's, that's a career. That's not a job. Jobs don't last that long. That's a career. So it's cemented it all together. So, I was so excited to get up on stage and tell my little bit of story that I had time to do. And it's so much longer than that, but um, it meant so much to me, Kristen, my wife, my kids, my family, everybody, because they all walked through that journey with me together and side by side through good times and bad times. And um, you, you never, it still really doesn't hit me as like it's happened, but, but it has happened and it's, it's the best thing in the world feeling wise. So there's no doubt about that. Was was it ever going to be anything but racing, or it, it it did your dad or your family race before Terry, or is it just you and Terry together figure this out? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question because my dad grew up in Rumford, Maine, which was close to Oxford Plain Speedway. So he he raced there a little bit as a young younger um, so I don't know how can I say that young guy, and uh, but I think when he turned eighteen, he joined the Navy Army Army, yeah Army. No, Navy. I'm mean, one of the two. Anyway, he moved to Texas. So what happened was um, he was involved in racing. He was, he liked racing. He was involved in cars, hot rods, you name it. So uh, he's uh, now driving. He wasn't quite that wasn't his deal, but he was a great mechanic. So mechanicing on cars was his specialty. So when he moved to Texas, short track there, CC Speedway, quarter mile asphalt, high bank. He starts going, meets people, helping people on cars on at nighttime after work. So, so he started helping guys at uh, at the short track. So he was always involved in it. So to get to your your point was when Terry was born, he became of age to race quarter midgets. Boom, he's racing. My dad's a mechanic, 
And I mean, the smart, I mean, engineers today are smart, you know, but back then you had to be, you know, you just had to trial and error and you had to do it without, you could do it with a, uh, a slide rule and a piece of paper, but you didn't have a computer. You didn't have the engineering background. My dad was so cool and he made stuff happen. Well, I, I can tell you, we had a quarter midget that my first car quarter midget, he built it and it looked like, man, it's somebody just put this thing together and how'd y'all do that, man? It was so fast. Well, what we didn't, people don't know is it had magnesium wheels on it. <laughs> what nobody knew was it had a live axle in the back of it instead of a solid axle. People had nice cars, but they wouldn't run with, were with the crap. We had a crap looking car that <laughs> beat everybody because we had a leaf spring on the front where he can adjust the wedge and it wedge back, back in the late sixties. You know what, what was that? You know what I mean? So, so my dad, he, uh, he worked for a rad Mac and he wrote books on the Huey helicopter on, uh, on engines and, and stuff like that. So he mechanically, he was all in. So when Terry, to your point, Terry and I both, there was never a question. We kind of did little things here and there differently, but we never really did a lot different. I mean, I had a mini bike or I had bicycles or I had this and that, but there was always going to be racing. It's going to be at the end of the day. Right. So, um, so there was never a doubt. And my dad was the guy that was, you know, put it all together for us. You kind of cross several eras of NASCAR, it seems to me. You you bridged from the early, early days, in some respects, very humble, wrenching on your own car, building your own car, to the heyday of Joe Gibbs and winning the Chick Cup championship. And, and when did it hit you like, holy crap, we're, this is, this is, this is a big deal. We, yeah, uh, I'm not sure it went on all at once. It was probably like on a dimmer switch. Maybe it was a clapper, you know, <laughs> uh, the lamp shade. But uh, uh, for me, and I'll, I'll fast forward it, but I think at Gibbs was probably the light switch. Because I remember, I remember racing my Bush Grand National car or my late model, just having enough money to get to the next weekend, just enough money the next weekend. When I got with Coach Gibbs, I don't know if you saw the banquet or not, but funny story is, when I was, I was making uh, X amount of dollars for Bill Davis, which I thought was the most money you'll ever make, right? And then when Joe, when I go to meet Joe and he says, I'll pay you this and slid it to me on a napkin and he had it written out, I looked at it and I went, that's three times more than I'm making now. And I just said, yes, sir, I'm, I'm in. Because it's like, <laughs> so that's probably part of the light switch that went on. Right. So when I got to Gibbs, that kind of helped uh, cement you're made it. You have made it to the cup series. You know, I was already in it for two years with Bill Davis. We were building a team, but Gibbs has already had a team for three or four years, three years and won races and we're going this way. You know what I mean? You, you cover a lot of bases in racing. You're certainly well known for, for the cup in, in the NASCAR side of things, but you, you ventured out in a couple other areas. You, you first tell me about your experience in becoming an IROC champion. Well, doing the IROC series is something that I had always watched. And uh, as a young kid, I would VCR tape all the races, whether they're Formula One, you can watch on TV, and you know, VCR tapes could fill up this room probably of uh, midget races, uh, IROC races, to cup races, to uh, Formula One, IndyCar races, all that stuff, right? <clears throat> so I was always a fan of the IndyCar, of the IROC series, because they had IndyCar drivers, they had all kinds of different. Uh, genre of drivers from uh, different uh, avenues so and I got invited to do it it was I mean that the Signori family and all that was the coolest thing and I, I hide that in fact behind the camera here there's not many trophies in the house besides a cup trophy but the IROC championship trophies in here expecting Mark Martin to go to the outside and leave him on. to me that was an accomplishment of the um, of the ex uh, experience and the different drivers in that series to race against them Greg Moore I mean all these people that I idolize Earnhardt you know Mark Martin uh, different from different venues Al Jr. you know I mean so all this I mean to me I thought that was one of the one of the championships that just like really sealed it for me because it's so uh, you have to drive the same car Everybody's got the same thing. Mark Dismore, uh, Ari Leindyke, you know, all those people, you know, and you got to race against them. So I just thought it was always a cool series to be in because it was not just cup guys. It was different uh, from different series as well. 
we're trying to pattern our VROC series after the IROC. The, the difference is obviously we don't have identically prepared cars, which I wish we could, but we're, we're not quite ready for prime time. But yeah. nonetheless, we've done uh, what I think has been so fun for me is to see the relationships that are forged as a result of it by pairing two guys together. Uh, you've become friends with Scott Rochetta uh, as part of this, and he was pretty gun ho to start this season to do the V-Rock <laughs> with you. But hopefully we'll, we'll get a race or two in before the end of the year. Tell me, you know, I've had several drivers on the last several, in the last few weeks, and I ask them one question I ask. They all seem to have a, a top five or a top three or a group of guys that – or someone in their racing career that just got under their skin when they raced that just is like banging heads. And, and it seems like it's more prevalent in NASCAR drivers because there's a little bit more pushing and shoving than you would get with an open wheel. Do you have a, a top five? Is there, a, is there a, a racer out there, I mean, that you can share with us that got it got under my skin? Um, gosh, you know, I really didn't I, – I have more of a top five of guys that I hung with, admired, respected. We all had good respect for each other. But, I mean, I, I'll be honest with you. I saw a clip on Twitter yesterday, came up with my phone, and it just makes me mad that I finished second to Jimmy Johnson at Darlington. And I think it was a Southern 500 or Trans Out 400. So, one of the two. But I thought, oh, damn, I forgot all about that. So then I thought, well, Jimmy Johnson beat me at the Charlotte for the Coke 600. Dang, I forgot all about that. So he, as far as – he's like the nicest guy, but he was probably a thorn in my side for about a year because I finished – I, you know, um, if he wouldn't have been there and been quite so good, I'd have probably won a handful more races, right? So um, – but, you know, in reality, I can't think of anybody that really got on my nerves week in and week out. Uh, there was a point in time, Rusty Wallace. I love Rusty Wallace. But there was a point in time that we were really, really good. And every time I'd go out to practice, I'd leave pit road. Here he'd come. He'd follow me out there, especially at Charlotte. We got and I'd he'd want to follow me so he can watch the line because it wasn't YouTube. There wasn't the camera thing wasn't like it is today. So he would go out there and follow me, and I just come back down pit road. And I'd wait for him to come in, I'd go back out. So we did that for a couple years, you know, because he was always trying to figure out how to get around Charlotte because I got around better than he did at that time. So I probably got underneath his skin more than he got under mine. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, that was uh, – yeah, I don't have any one person or two people. So uh, every now and then you got guys that are just kind of pains, but, you know, usually it subsides. Who's your hero? Do you have a hero? Uh, you know, my brother is my hero. It is now my honor on this 31st day of January 2020 to present the NASCAR Hall of Fame inductee ring and officially induct – my brother, Bobby Labonte, into the NASCAR Hall of Fame. From as early as I can remember, uh, there were two things I did as a kid. I raced quarter midgets in South Texas, and I watched my brother race. I idolized him. So after all these years, I stand before you following in my brother's footsteps. In fact, I'm even wearing the same tie he wore the night he got inducted. <clears throat> From a daily life to racing, you know what I mean? So whether I'm going to call him a little bit to figure out how to cook this brisket I got to <laughs> understand financials, uh, what he's doing, uh, what he's done. To, you know, when I was a kid growing up, I mean, um, riding on his back to the house from a friend's house and uh, him always taking care of me. And, uh, you know, whether it was telling me, hey, you need to quit doing that. You need to do this or, hey, good job on that. But he was always my hero growing up and still is. Well, today. I, I got to tell you, you are uh, such a gentleman and such a gracious man. I so admire you and I really appreciate you taking the time with us today. And I can't wait to get back to the races and um, get with Scott and hopefully uh, do a little uh, B-Rock in a, in, a, in a Corvette that's going to haul the mail and beat Willie T. Ribs. 
<laughs> he he uh he was excited to run against you. Uh he knew that you guys had put a good program together for this year. So he wants to defend that crown. He's like, he was he was talking some smack. He said you called him and said he's lucky for him that they COVID nineteen came out because you're gonna whoop him. So it's yeah. <laughs> uh, well, it's always good to see you, my friend. I'll uh, we'll catch up soon, but thank you. And tell tell Chris and I said hello. All right, we'll do. Thank you. See you guys. All right. Thanks, Bobby.